So, um, Sarah uh, Elizabeth Biosier uh, and I have been catching up. Uh, she's the class of 2010, Green Hills class of 2010, and she and I have been catching up for the past uh, 10 minutes, and um, and now we're going to begin the part of our conversation that uh, uh, will involve you and, and uh, your learning from Sarah and hearing a little bit about what she's doing and um, also uh, beam with pride with me um, as, uh, as Green Hills people and having people like Sarah out in the world. So it's nice to see you, Sarah. It's nice uh, to be here. I'm gonna give you a, a, you all just a little bio uh, on, on Dr. Biozier. Wow, it sounds great to see. I was gonna say, I, it, it's amazing I'm saying that out of this, this little kid that I knew, but you were always tall. So even when you were, you were a little kid, right? Um, Dr. Biozier is the director of the Thinking Dog Center at SUNY Hunter College where she focuses on studying the behavior and cognition of domestic dogs and other canids. She began her career right here at the University of Michigan where she studied the function of the play bow in adult pet dogs throughout her undergraduate and master's degrees. She has worked at various canine cognition and behavior research groups, including the Duke Canine Cognition Center, the Clever Dog Lab, and the Wolf Science Center. Dr. Biozier earned her PhD at La Trobe University in Australia under the supervision of Dr. Pauline Bennett and the Anthrozoology Research Group. Her dissertation focused on evaluating whether or not dogs are susceptible to visual illusions. More recently at the Thinking Dog Center, her work has expanded to include applied research topics, including dog training methodologies and sheltering practices. Dr. Biozier has published her research in peer-reviewed scientific journals, presented her findings at conferences, and has been featured on NPR Science Friday, the New York Daily News, Gizmodo, and Curiosity Stream. But most importantly, Dr. Biozier is a graduate of the Green Hills School class of 2010, or a member of the Green Hills School class of 2010. So, Sarah, there, my first question for you. Uh -oh. Was there anything in your time at Green Hills that, that planted a seed that you might someday spend your days thinking about what dogs think? I, th I think so. It's actually funny that you um, asked this question because the other day I was going through my memories on my phone. You know, you can link it so that it tells you like eight years ago today you were doing this and like 10 years ago today you were doing that. And I came across one like a week and a half ago that was about giraffes and evolution and how, you know, in, in explaining the world around us with these weird animals that have these long necks that look totally bizarre that the only explanation really for them is evolution or it is, is at least a possible explanation and i looked at the date and it was like 11 years ago and i was thinking i was like 11 years ago i must have been in 11th grade at green hills and i must have been taking um mr freelander's opec class and this would totally make sense uh, as to why this is coming up on on my feed um, and so I, I think I, when I was at Green Hills, I took a lot of science classes. I really enjoyed all the science classes. I think I took like three classes with Dr. Smith and any class I could take with Mr. Friedlander. Um, but I really think that OPEC class had a lot to do uh, with my interest in animals. Until that class, I didn't really recognize that you could have a career in studying animal behavior. And that class was a, a really eye-opening experience and one that I don't think a lot of students actually get until they're in college because by the time I was in at the University of Michigan, I realized that yes, you can study animals and there are people here, but a lot of uh, other students had no idea. And so I do think that having that experience in that class uh, with Mr. Friedlander in particular was really helpful to sort of get a leg up and and figure out what possibly I wanted to do. Huh. Yeah, I, well, I'm sure Mr. Friedlander and Dr. Smith and others will be tickled to hear that. Um, I was hoping you would say it was because of my dog Griffin. So that would be my- Slightly. 
<laughs> it could have been. I mean, you never know. I, I, Mr. Friedlander definitely helped me figure out that I was interested in, in animals, but um, I, even though I, I studied um, and had a background that was more in, in primatology and anthropology for a while, I sort of realized very early on that I was not the type of person that would do well um, in a remote area in the middle of nowhere without plumbing, internet, and running water. And so then the question sort of became, what can you then study that is easily accessible and um, present in in our society and and so dogs are a great example of that in particular then again i traveled to australia to do my phd because apparently dogs were not common enough in the u.s to actually study them so <laughs> you know <laughs> well any any opportunity to go to australia i suppose exactly um hey you did uh the thinking dog center um first of all Fab, any place that's any place I want to be uh, is a place where they have thinking dogs. Um, can you tell us uh, about the center and also your work there? Yeah, um, the center is uh, one of the newer dog cognition and behavior research um, centers. So there's a lot of them spread out across the US. Some of them have been around for 10 years. Others are, are newer and we are one of the newer ones. Um, but it is essentially a space on a university campus that is just dedicated to dogs. So when oh, what we essentially ask is um, that New York City dog owners sign up if they want to obtain uh, a doggery, as we call it, um, or their bark chillers, um, or a certificate of paw dissipation. We're, we're really spot on with the puns. We, we love it. Um, and, and so they sign up their dog and we try to get some basic uh, info about their pet to see, is there a particular study or research question that they would best be suited for? So one of our main goals is to make sure that the dogs we bring in are actually gonna be comfortable in our space. We want them to have fun. This is not a place where uh, we are putting dogs in stressful situations. This is a place where we're playing fun problem solving games to try to study uh, dog cognition and what they know about the world around them. So uh, once we have an, an owner who we think is a great fit for a certain study, they get an email, they sign up to come in, they basically schedule an appointment and uh, bring their dog uh, to the campus. And they have this great hallway and building space that's like decked out in dog art. We even had a graffiti artist um, who would tag buildings in the, I think in the early eighties around New York city who came in and, and tagged a hundred and some plus graffiti dogs for us. Um, and then they come in and they're the only dog there. And there's a couple of uh, undergrad and master's students that get to hang out and play with the dog and the dog gets comfortable. They settle in. Uh, many of them kind of think maybe that this is like a weird vet's office. They're kind of like, where's the catch here? Like it smells like other dogs. You've kind of got the flooring of the vet's office. Like where, what's going to happen to me next? But they quickly find out that, you know, we're just there to play with them and, and engage. And uh, then we start our study. And depending on what study we're running, it, it can vary what the dog's doing. So sometimes we have, um, kind of special fences or, or gates where dogs have to kind of figure out how to navigate around them. And we're interested at what strategies they use to navigate certain barriers. And if there's food that's like right in front of their face, but isn't attainable, can they separate themselves from that and take a, a path around? Um, and then we also look at uh, other uh, questions about do dogs sort of um, ask for help? And how do they do that, um, especially if, a, if they have a, a treat or a toy that's in a container that is locked and they can't actually get in it, how long do they try to persist to open up that container? Or do they essentially just sit down and, and stare at us and say, hey, can you, can you open this? Like, I've got some paws, uh, I need thumbs. <laughs> so we, those are generally the types of studies that we do at the center, yeah. um, but we also do stuff outside in zoos, at animal shelters, in training schools, all that fun stuff. So I'm curious that that um, that question, you know, do dogs ask for help? Like my my in initial response is, of course they do, right? Even you know, she whines at me. My dog whines when she wants to go out. Um, she carries my boots around when she wants to go for a hike. Like I, th is that asking for help or is that uh, what's going on there? Uh, yeah. 
So, so dogs are particularly interesting from a cognition and from an animal behavior perspective um, for a variety of different reasons. But one of the big reasons that is relatively unique um, is that they tend to really understand human given social cues um, and, and they, can, they can use them and, and um, figure out kind of what we want, which is amazing, right? Because if you think about it, your, your dog is essentially then understanding the equivalent of like human referential language um, or something um, and interpreting that and using it to kind of figure out what comes next. And so this is something that um, when you ask dog owners, like, does your dog, if you point to something, does your dog follow that point? Many people will say yes. And that seems like such a simple skill, but following pointing is actually something that we, uh, our closest living primate ancestors are not necessarily the best at. They're huh. not great at following uh, social types of um, communicative tasks, but the, our, our primate uh, uh, ancestors and relatives are pretty good at logical, physical world understandings, things like gravity and all this other stuff. Um, but dogs really excel at the social component. And so the question then becomes, is this because of the way that they've co-evolved with humans or is there something special about this relationship? Have we just artificially selected over time for certain traits that make them better suited to live in human homes and understand what we want them to do? Um, but there's some amazing research out there to, to kind of answer your question that dogs have muscles in their in their eyebrows and that you see it more in newer breeds rather than in ancestral breeds. And the assumption and what we're trying to figure out now is whether or not they're used for communication, um, either between dogs or between dogs and humans. And because dog vision isn't maybe as excellent as it is in humans, the first thought is, well, we have really expressive eyebrows. We move them up and down a lot. And so possibly with dogs, maybe they also have expressive eyebrows because we use it as some sort of communicative cue. And so maybe they now do as well because it's super cute and we, we want cute dogs that have these physical features that are really right. adorable. And so, I mean, it certainly is the case that the dogs, whether or not they're, they're trying to tell you something um, and if that's purposeful, we don't know that yet, but they do have all these amazing adaptations to fit well into human society. Right. So, um, you know, uh, over the years, one develops sort of uh, theories, whether uh, things I've read and, uh, and then I just repeat them. And uh, so tell me how, uh, how ridiculous this is, or am I saying the wrong thing? Or, you know, my understanding uh, of the way in which dogs evolved to be what I, what I think are the only animals with this kind of relationship, right? Uh, whether this, this symbiotic relationship, uh, you know, we know what they get from us. They get, they get uh, fed, they get, um, you know, shelter, they get all that. And that was first learned uh, and therefore uh, traits evolved when that first canid walked into some Neanderthal uh, site and, acted like a puppy, right? Or like in somebody, you know, Thor mm -hmm. or thug or whatever walked over and sort of was buoyed spiritually by that sort of, as you said, that, 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 that look. And then there, there began this evolution uh, of, and, and I guess reinforced what I've read at least is that, you know, that wolf pups, they, they lose that early on where dogs, keep it. Tell me how ridiculous what I just said is or not ridiculous. Um, so <laughs> it's actually, I always think back, um, I worked with uh, a researcher in, in Vienna for a little while. And when she was a PhD student, uh, the dog kind of cognition world was just kicking off. And I remember uh, it, this was in Hungary. She was a student uh, at a university in Hungary. Essentially what they did was they wanted to see, okay, what happens if you rear a wolf like a dog? Will it turn into a dog or hmm. will it be a wolf? What goes on? Um, and there's actually some really great videos of this on YouTube. Moral of the story was that the experiment ended rather quickly. Um, I think at about month 
five or six, they had to pull all the wolf pups from the PhD students because they were wreaking havoc on the house, jumping on tables, guarding food resources, demolishing fridges, like all of this, these behaviors that, you know, are acceptable for wolves, but are not common in household pets. Um, and, and they had a lot of difficulty in trying to mediate them. So certainly there are some weird, um, I say weird, but they're actually probably very cool features that um, make your dog very unique that are not just uh, experience and learning based, but also probably have to do with the underlying genetics and, and their evolution that don't really, um, you don't really find in, in wolves. Right. Um, yeah, I, uh, yeah, okay, good. So should I keep promulgating that theory? You can. There's, <laughs> there's lots of theories. It's actually quite funny that I, one of the first theories that came out about the coevolution um, between dogs and humans was this idea that maybe uh, humans had like gone into wolf dens and picked out wolves and all, and all this stuff. And so that one, it, it could still be the case, but uh, I think we have some other theories now that are more about um, human waste and things like this. So wherever you have sedentary uh -huh. groups of people that settle down, they tend to produce waste, whether or not it's leftover meat or, or things like this. And that all it takes really is, is one hungry and one brave or less uh, scared of, you know, humans, um, uh, kind of a wolf dog ancestor to make that approach to kind of realize that there's a niche there that they can occupy, a food resource that they can obtain. And slowly uh -huh. you might be able to see that from the human perspective or an, an ancestral human perspective, um, there might be benefits to having these creatures kind of live around you. It might mean that you're less subject to predation from other creatures right. that might be more dangerous. So you're right in saying that it could be some type of symbiotic, mutually beneficial mm -hmm. uh, context that sort of led way to this amazing relationship where we spend a ton of time and money and effort in taking care of these pets in our own home. Um, very different from back then. Right, right. Yeah, and it it certainly doesn't behoove a dog to act like a wolf then if uh, the dog wants to be around our waste, <laughs> right? If, it, you know, if we're attacking the, the, the people providing it for us, then... Uh, exactly. So, yeah, interesting. So I, I, uh, can you tell us a little bit about your, your current research, particularly on an object permanence? Yeah. Um, we're, we're currently, we had to switch. So because of, of COVID and, and all of this stuff, we actually don't have access to our space in, in, uh, at the university. And so we've been trying to figure out what can you do now in terms of dog research? And actually one of the things that you can do is you can ask people to be community scientists. You can come up with experiments that are designed to happen in the home and you can ask people um, who are dog owners to see if they want to spend an afternoon trying something out with their dog, engaging with them, hopefully in what we believe is always an enriching experience, um, and then submit videos and data to us so that we can see how their dog did and, and it can add to this collective pool of research. So that's kind of the, the lens and the framework we've been using recently. And the study that we've been focusing on for dogs at the moment is based off of this what the fluff viral trend that went um, around social media. I think it's about a year and a half ago now. And it's this trend where you stand in a doorway with a blanket and you do these things, we call them peekaboos. So you stand in the doorway with the blanket and you kind of look at your dog, show them that you're there. And then you put the blanket up a little bit higher, you drop it. And while it's dropping, you move out of the door frame so that your dog thinks that you've magically disappeared, but you know, you're really just behind the corner. And so um, this viral trend went around and you saw all these funny reactions online of dogs being like, huh, what's, what's happening? Like, where's my owner? What's going on? And so we thought, oh, this would be perfect. We can study object permanence and violation of expectations in, in dogs using one, something that's pretty simple to do um, in this way that owners seem to like to engage with their pets. And um, we did, we're, we're still collecting data for it. We've seen some pretty funny videos. The best part about community science is that owners can then tell you what happened and what went wrong. And so we've seen some great, great examples that people have sent us of, you know, the dogs standing there, the owners doing their peekaboos. And then when they're ready to drop, the dog just sits down and, you know, starts to pee mid, mid test. 
And they're just like, what do I do now? Like, how do I help science? And it's like, that's okay. You know, this is a response. We, we didn't, it's one that was unexpected, but we still got a response. So great. Right. Um, so that's what we've been working on and, and conducting. We don't have results uh, yet. Um, so it'll be interesting to see what's going on there. But um, I think the best way I can think about explaining object permanence is this idea that when objects disappear, do they, or if they kind of go behind something, the question is then, did they really disappear and they're no longer there or are they hidden? And yep. this is a phenomenon that um, you have different stages of object permanence. And so you have um, kids who will develop this understanding over time that no objects don't actually go away. They um, are just kind of hidden. So that's like when you do peekaboo with babies, sometimes they react like really startled. Right. Um, and then the question is, do they really think that you're totally gone when you do this or, or what's going on? Um, and so in dogs, I always like to say that the best example I can always think of are these personal anecdotes, which they're not scientific, but how does your dog react when a tennis ball goes under the couch and they can't necessarily see it? Do they still persist at trying to get to it or do they act like, oh, it's gone now, can't, can't do anything about it? Um, and so while there's some disagreement currently about what level of object permanence dogs display, I think it's pretty safe to say that they have some capacity of, of object permanence, um, but whether or not it's as um, complex or to the point uh, of humans, that's kind of where we're at trying to figure out what's going on. Well, interesting. I mean, it makes me think or ask the question then, um, you know, we're, we're talking about object permanence, or we seem to be talking about object permanence from our perspective with our sensorial experiences and capabilities and limitations for a dog if my understanding is that essentially their sense of smell is you know is is uh, dominates so where does that come in you know sure you could put a blanket in front of a person but the dog might still know you're there because they can smell you or the for the dog the tennis ball goes under the couch yes the dog can't see it but unlike us they know it's there because they can smell it is that yeah, um, so dogs do have an exceptional sense of smell. And what's very interesting is that the majority of dog cognition experiments have actually come from the primate literature. So what, we, what we've been doing for the last 20 years while we've been studying dogs is taking these cognition tasks that were essentially developed for primates, and we've been applying them to dogs. And that means mm -hmm. that 75% roughly was the last estimate that I read um, of these tasks are visually based. Right. And so certainly you have a problem there, right? Which is exactly what you're noting that you may have species specific tasks that are required for dogs that differ from what's expected for primates. Primates are pretty visual. Um, mm -hmm. At least most of the great apes are pretty visual. Mm -hmm. um, and so it makes sense to kind of use the visual system to evaluate some of these questions about cognition. But then when we apply these tests to dogs, it's not necessarily clear, especially in instances where you don't have a, a robust finding or a clear answer to your question or your scientific uh, inquiry about, you know, are they actually falling for this or are they demonstrating evidence for this or what's going on? Is it then because the test was not adequate and not suitable or is it actually then a representation of a dog's inability to understand what's going on around them? So it's super important that we do evaluate species specific um, uh, assessments because otherwise we won't disentangle that. Sure, that makes sense. So, you know, um, you had mentioned, uh, you had uh, likened a dog's, um, you know, uh, approach to, or at least experience with object permanence to a baby's. And we asked some of our Green Hills uh, psychology students uh, who read up on you and watched some of your videos and learned a little bit about the work that you're doing and what questions would do they have for you? And one of them is, is ex exactly the right question is, you know, does, does the development of object permanence in dogs occur in the same manner as it does with, with human children? 
Yeah, so interestingly enough, I don't think we have tons of evidence that looks, or at least there's not a lot of studies out there that developmentally track the same dogs throughout their development in relation to object permanence. Mm. But there are some studies that sort of look at a variety of different dogs um, of different ages possibly, um, and sort of evaluates if they demonstrate levels of object permanence. It's kind of uh, it's a great example, actually, of science at work, the study of object permanence in dogs, because the original researchers who started asking this question actually stated for a while that they had that dogs did have a human like or at least a very high level of object permanence. And that was pretty remarkable at the time. And people were very enthused and um, excited about that prospect. And the original researchers from that uh, from that article then started digging into this question further and further and further. And ultimately, I think by the time they had published the third paper on this, they had found that there was actually a, an, a, a confound that could explain the dog's performance on the task through a um, trial and error or learning based approach rather than um, uh, an explanation that was 100% um, for object permanence. And so they actually ended up writing more papers about, oops, we were right, but there is another possibility here. We need to backtrack a little bit, reassess. And, and so they've been doing this and they've been figuring this out. And so now they've kind of figured out that dogs do have some aspect of object permanence, but it is not to the level of, of what we see in humans. And, and so I think it's a great example of how science works, right? Sometimes you think you find this great groundbreaking result and it's a little bit surprising and you get really excited and uh, you think it's going to change everything and then you start looking into it and you're like, okay, let's reevaluate. And okay, now we have a better answer or a more robust answer. That's great. Um, so another question, another really good question um, uh, along the lines of research and science and, you know, which is oftentimes obviously to better understand the world, but also to better understand the world so that we can sort of live in it in a, in a better, more responsible, sustainable way. Uh, is the goal of your research, this is a question coming from one of our students, is the goal of your research to, to better understand animals, um, humans, or both? That's such an interesting question, actually, um, because I think if you had asked me this when I had started um, my, my career, like my dissertation and my, my PhD research, I probably would have said that it was for... Um, that it was partly for science and partly to understand animals better. But I actually think that that's, for me personally, has changed quite dramatically. Mm -hmm. um, I originally got into this just because I thought it was, I thought it was cool. And I was like, this is really awesome. Dogs have a good time doing these things. People have a good time doing these things. It tells us a lot. Let's, you know, let's go with it. It's fun. Um, but in opening the the Thinking Dog Center in New York, one of the things that came out of it was that sometimes you have dogs that come in for a visit and they have a great time, but their data is maybe not usable for some reason. Like maybe maybe we messed up as experimenters, or maybe um, the dog behaved in a way that was indicative of, you know, a little bit of. Um, concern because they just wanted to be with their owner and so they didn't really approach the apparatus like we expected and so i've sort of thought recently that the best thing that comes out of the research that we do is that an owner takes an hour and a half of their time essentially to take their dog, travel with them to Times Square, um, gets to come with us, gets to play with us, gets to do something novel with their dog that is hopefully enriching and um, you know exciting for the dog. It's something new. They, you, know, you can go to the dog park, you can go to puppy daycare, you can meet up with dog friends, but going to a dog cognition center and playing problem solving games, like that's that's not something you do every day. And so I keep thinking now recently that even if we don't get data, even though my students are super frustrated by that, they're just like, why are you so excited about the dogs coming in? They, this one didn't, we didn't get data from this participant. And I'm like, yeah, but like, you don't understand. You've, you've taught now one owner about this amazing experience. You've told them a little bit more about what their dog knows and how they understand the world around them. You've educated them on various aspects of dog behavior. And this dog has had a really good time doing something with us mm -hmm. and doing something with them. And so half the time I, it's, it's like the data is great. I love the data, it tells us a lot, but also the individual experience, 
um, of, of doing something like this with each dog and doing something like this with each owner, I think is actually the most rewarding part. And one of the most important parts, because if owners don't know how their dogs behave or why their dogs behave in a certain way or how they understand the world around them, we, we can't expect that they're going to change their behavior to best fit their, their pet. So I think that's actually the most important part. So I'm, I'm, we do it for both, but I think more recently, it's about the individuals involved. Yeah, yeah. So another good question from a student uh, involves owners and dogs. And um, I, while I imagine the people that you see, it's pretty self-selective in terms of um, the care uh, that, that the people who come in uh, yeah demonstrate for their animals, uh, ethical care, responsible care, humane care. Um, but one of the questions is a good one, is that, uh, you know, as a research organization and as you as a research, how do you, uh, how do you ensure that the work that you're doing, the research that you're doing with dogs is ethical, particularly if many of these people are doing that work at home? Yeah, so we have, we have little control over what people do at home. Um, and, and we, we always, we don't really have sponsorships or we don't really support um, organizations. We, we have recommendations for where owners can find info. So if somebody were to ask, you know, do you have a good dog trainer around? It's not necessarily our place to recommend a dog trainer. It's our place to inform and educate where an owner can find that information, because it is really hard to find information from adequate sources about pets. There's lots of blogs out there. There's lots of TV shows and not all of them are um, filled with good quality content right. that you should be uh, utilizing. So one of our goals is, is to teach people how to critically evaluate what is ethical and what's appropriate, mm. um, not necessarily just to give them an answer. Um, but it, it is a really good question. And so it's always funny when we fill out our um, our, our, our IACUCs, which are essentially our animal ethics applications that need to get approved before we conduct a study. And most of these uh, forms, <laughs> they generally are for, for lab animals. And so they have these areas that are, are about how are you going to reduce the number of participants and minimize the stress and all of these other things. And oftentimes I find myself having to put in that this is a problem solving study where the outcome is rewards and is exciting and enriching. And so for this particular study, for example, um, it may be the case that we want to actually get as many dogs as possible because we want to have as many of them participate, but also because we want as many of them to have this enjoyable experience. Whereas with lab animals, it might be about how do you reduce potentially the number of animals that are subject to a certain procedure. Um, so there's this weird gray area in, in the ethics and, and it can be hard, um, but we, we generally have to try to figure out from other studies what type of sample size is necessary. And we don't go over that and we don't go under that. We try to stay within our, our framework of, of what is ethically appropriate, but also helps us give a solid answer to science. Right. Huh. A um, couple more questions from kids. And then I know that you have, um, you have a, an assignment for me with my dog. Um, or, or at least I can, I can participate in a little bit you of can. Wait, we, we can, um, <laughs> she's participating in sleeping, which and nap which, session. Yes. Which actually is, uh, it pertains to, uh, a question, another question from a student, which is an awesome question. We all want to know um, when our dogs are sleeping, like um, she is right now on her side, oh. and those those paws are going like this, and they're they're you know making that sort of yelping sound, muffled yelping. What are they dreaming about? Are they just dreaming about running like we all think? What's going on? I don't know. I mean, I would, so there is recently in the last probably four years, um, the Hungarian Family Dog Project, uh, their research group, they have been focusing on sleep in dogs. And they've done some really interesting things um, in using um, EEGs to sort of map the waves when dogs are sleeping. So like the first thing here is that you have to realize that you have to get a dog then to lie still with equipment on, on their head and get them to be comfortable enough 
for them to sleep. So like, this is a lot of effort in, in training um, that goes into all of this. But once they do all that, they've actually found that dogs have like this equivalent of like REM sleep cycles as, as humans do. And they have, um, they're now starting to study different aspects of like sleep spindles to figure out, you know, maybe, maybe they're actually trying to figure out what they're dreaming about. Um, when they're when they're moving, it's the equivalent of when we twitch and, and move in our sleep. And, and sometimes we dream when that happens. And sometimes, um, you know, we don't dream. And sometimes we think we don't dream and we're probably dreaming. Um, I like to personally think <laughs> that they're dreaming. I think that's a great way to look at it. I also think that a lot of these um, comparisons that we make between humans and, and animals, they're not a does an animal have it? Yes or no. It's more of a spectrum. So it's very likely from an evolutionary lens and a perspective that you see foundations of the same mechanisms or behaviors or explanations um, underlying given phenomenon that just vary on a spectrum. So are they aware then that they're sleeping? Maybe not, or that they're dreaming while they're sleeping. Are they aware of that? Who knows? Um, we are, but maybe they aren't. I, I don't know, but I like to think that they, they're still dreaming. It's yeah, nice. <laughs> and my my daughter, of course, uh, she has these whole narratives about what what Kyle is doing when she's sleeping. We should she write sleeping? a storybook about it. Probably should. Um, hey, uh, and then a last question, um, and then I have a question for you, and then we'll get. It. Um, <laughs> are dogs self aware? And then, how do we know? Such a good question, and literally the the question that plagues dog cognition researchers, and probably will for the next you know, at least thirty years. We'll see. Um, it's a hard one. So far, we have very little. I say very. We have some evidence that dogs might be self aware. I just don't think it's super convincing yet. Mm. Um, personally and anecdotally, like I said before, I'd love to think that they're self aware, um, and I do think that you can see some aspects that at least anecdotally that can help us or that might suggest that that they are um, right now we know that or we have evidence that elephants and and dolphins and a couple of um, other primates are demonstrating um, self-awareness this is typically done in the form of what they call them the mark test so what when an animal is sleeping essentially they put a little mark on on their forehead and the idea is that when they wake up and if they have already been exposed to a mirror you can see what they do when they look at themselves do they touch the mirror thinking that it's on the mirror or on the image in the mirror or do they touch themselves because if they touch their own forehead it's indicative of potentially an understanding that that representation in the mirror is really them. Um, right. And we've tried the mirror test in dogs. It doesn't work out very well. Um, the explanation is exactly what you said earlier. They assume that maybe it's not a lack of self-awareness, but that a visual test like the Mark test is not the most suitable one for dogs. So recently there's been an olfactory version that has come out. Uh, which looks at, <laughs> it's pretty funny, it looks at how long dogs sniff essentially their pee compared to other dogs pee. Yeah. Um, and so I, the reason why I say I'm not sure this is super convincing is that I think there must be other explanations for smelling something that smells like you versus something that doesn't, that may not indicate self-awareness, but that just may indicate familiarity. And so for now, the jury's still out on, on dogs, but it would be cool one day to figure out if they can, you know, do they, do they have also the little voice in their head that, that tells them, you know, about their day and what's going yeah. on and all this stuff. Huh. Um, you know, I, I, uh, I have always told, and don't, t anybody watching this, don't reveal this to my daughter um, <laughs> who would like a cat, but I've always told people I'm allergic to cats, but Frankly, I just don't like them very much. Um, Are you actually <laughs> allergic to cats? <laughs> I, no, I, I have I have a healthy I, uh, I have healthy <laughs> respect for cats. What I know about cats, like what, what I really know, is if they were the size of dogs, they would have eaten us a long time ago. Cats, <laughs> I suffer us. They're amazing animals. I just would never want one as a pet. So. Um, uh, what is the difference? I mean, there the, are two animals that live in our homes. Yeah. Um, I, I mean, I'm sure there's other animals that live in the homes, but uh, 
What's the difference between cats and dogs? Yeah, so I think I'll, they're both domesticated animals, right? So there's some parallels here. The domesticated animals, they come from two different ancestral species. One is from the, the Canis line, the other is from the Felis line. So there's some, some evolutionary differences there as well. Um, also, we talked briefly about, you know, this idea of how a dog is different from a wolf and how that process from a wolf-like ancestor to a modern dog may have occurred and how that may have come about. Mm -hmm. And with cats, it, it's similar. It's also when humans start living in a sedentary lifestyle and they start having food stores, for example, um, what comes along when you store grain and, and rice, you get rodents. And what do cats like to eat? And what's a nice food source for them? Rodents. So you once again have this mutualistic relationship. So humans like the fact that the cats are around and keeping their, their grain stores rodent free. And so there's some, you know, things that are, are good for both the cats um, and for the humans. So lots of parallels between what we see with this relationship with mm -hmm. dogs, but there's a difference, right? Some people might say that the dogs require, like a dog in a household requires a little bit more care. Cats might be a little bit more independent um, and so what's interesting is that that's sometimes true as, as like a general perspective, but at an individual level, you can have very independent dogs and you can have very needy cats. And so sometimes, um, and recently I've been loving seeing this, you have these like adventure cats on Instagram that like go out in, in backpacks or in, in baskets on bikes right. and like explore the world with their owner. And it's more of what you would like consider to be a relationship that a human would have with their dog, not necessarily right. with their cat. Um, but the cat cognition world is a little bit slow compared to the dog cognition world. Mm. And one of the big reasons for this is, is that traditionally it has been more normal for a dog to go out on a leash and to get used to the city and to bring them into unfamiliar places where a lot of cats would probably freak out quite a bit if one day you just did this. Right. Um, so that means that we don't necessarily always have specific sites that study cat cognition in the same way that you do for, for dogs. Um, but citizen science is actually a really great way of doing this as well. Uh, I had a student this summer who did a great study. It was super fun. Um, also based off of a social media challenge, cats like to sit in boxes, right? And one of the things that went viral a few years ago was that if you taped a square onto the floor, cats would also sit in a square. And so there are different illusions out there. And one of the things that I study is illusion susceptibility in dogs. And there's a square illusion out there where humans see a figural square, even though there's no connective bits that actually make a square. So she had this question of if you had owners put a illusory square on the ground, would cats also then sit in it? And um, it was this great study that she did over the summer. And she's hopefully this year, the, the findings will be out. But moral of the story is it, it seems like cats might sit in illusory squares. Um, which is cool because that tells us something about cat illusion susceptibility. Wow. So, so cats are cool. They're just a yeah. little different. No, I know. I, you know, it's, it's, I've always said that, um, you know, one of my other tropes is when dog people like myself try to convince non-dog people or cat people uh, to love a dog, they describe their dog in cat terms, right? Oh, independent, doesn't bother you, it's on its own. When cat people try to convince dog people, it's like, oh no, always wants to be petted. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but you're right, obviously there are different kinds of cats and dogs. Um, all right, Sarah um, and Kylie, she just picked her head up. What are we doing? What are you doing? What do you want yeah. to do? I don't know. Tell, so, what can you do with my with with Kyle? What can you do with your dog? Let's see. Let's go. Is she is she still sleeping? Still nap time? Oh, no. she's, she's oh she's alert. Yes. Cute. Um. So one of the things that we can do is, do you have any any cups there or something fun like a like a coffee mug or something? Yes, I'll get a coffee mug. Cool. By any chance, do you have any snacks on you or a tennis ball? Uh, I can find both. Um. I even see a baseball under the chair. Baseball. Yep. All right. Does it need to cool. fit in the cup? Does it fit in it? It does. Cool. Is that good? Oh, awesome. Yeah. So one of the things that you can do, do you have another coffee mug by any chance? Another coffee mug? I'm, I'm using a Green Hills coffee mug. A I love it. Yeah, I'll get, uh, we'll send one to you. Hang on. 
Yes. She's ready. She knows what she's doing. Yeah. She's, she's like, no, fooling me. perfect. And they're identical, even better. Science yeah. loves okay, uh, when you have two cups. Okay. So <laughs> she's so ready. So what you can do is you can put those cups on the ground and don't tell her, don't show her where the, the, the ball actually is just flip them upside down really quickly. Okay. All right. We're going to do this. All right. Oh. All right. You ready? Hi. Okay. She problem solve it already. <laughs> okay. Perfect. Now, uh, what you can do is when she's kind of paying attention to you, if you remember which one you put the ball in, point to that one for like yep. a couple of seconds and then remove your finger from it. Okay, so what am I doing again? So, does she know how to sit? Uh, oh, she just- uh, She right, did right, it! Right, right. <laughs> all right, Kylie, come here, come here, sit. Okay, Kylie, right, sit, sit. There you uh, go. All right, what are we doing right. now? So point to the one that has the tennis ball in it. And when you're done, say, okay. Okay. Kylie, okay, Kylie, come here. Okay, okay, all right. And flip it over for her. Kylie. Yes, good job. All right, let her, let her have that for a second and we'll do it one more time. Okay. Now you can try it in the other cup, see what she does. So now I put it in the other cup? Yeah. Perfect. Yeah. All right, same thing. You're gonna to point to one a couple of times and then remove your point. Point to the one with the ball in it? Yeah. Kylie. Come on, Kylie. Okay. Kylie. Okay. She's like, I just love attention. No, she does. Oh, so she picked the last one that she got. So you can flip it over for her and there's no tennis ball in there. So what we're doing here is essentially um, like a, a parody or like a, a different version of um, one of these referential communication tasks. And yep. when you do this multiple times over and over again, you'll get a result for, for Kylie that will tell her tell you whether or not she's following your point, yes or no. Um, um, and the idea is that dogs are actually really quite good at this. So when you point to the container that has the, the tennis ball in it, odds are is that she will start going to the one that you point to. Um, uh, what's cool though, is that she went to the one that where it was in originally, right? So she right. kind of booped the one where it was in first, which is telling you that she's not using your cue. She's actually just using her memory. Um, and that's another strategy. I mean, if it was there last, why wouldn't it be there now? So right. different ways. There's no reason why my dog shouldn't be like my children. They don't listen to me. They <laughs> just do whatever they want to do. <laughs> you can always try it at home and, and see maybe she maybe she follows one of the kids cues better and uh it is really you know spot on with following them yeah there's usually there, there's food there, involved with that. there actually is a is a paper that came out this year about adolescents in in dogs uh and they do find that teenage dogs at you know i think my cat has the zoomies right now i don't know if you can hear that but he's he's rampaging um but uh, there's this paper about dogs uh, having this adolescent period where they stop yep. listening to their owner, but they'll huh. actually listen to a stranger. So it's not that when you say sit and your dog refuses to when they're about seven months old, that they can't sit, they'll listen to the stranger. They just won't listen to you. Oh, interesting. They're just, they're testing. Yeah, it's like that, that teenage rebellion. <laughs> yeah, that's sort of how I remember you when you were here too, Sarah. Oh. <laughs> kidding of course well hey listen this has been tons of fun um who'd have thought that you'd have me lying on the floor in my office i was just gonna say you're on all fours i mean yeah, no. <laughs> <laughs> um i think kylie and i are gonna take a nap and um she deserves so, it. <laughs> sarah what a joy how much fun to talk with you thanks and, for having me and uh, you know everybody again who's watching this uh dr Biosier, green hills class of 2010 yeah, um, ten year uh, reunion this year it would have been. Oh, that's right. Would have been. We'll have to make that up to you. Did we have some sort of virtual one? We should. We I don't think one. so. We'll have an epic celebration one of these days. Absolutely, I think there's going to be a lot of epic celebrations going on. Um, oh, Sarah, yeah. it's so nice to see you, and uh, and don't be a stranger. Actually, you know. Anyways, uh, stop by. Sounds good. And uh, masked, socially distant, all those things, and. Um, Take good care. Thanks. Okay. Sounds good. Bye.